Welcome to A Natural History. So thrilled to be hosting our outgoing advisor, Sean, who has been such a beacon to Hawk all these years. Really excited to introduce him. But before I do, I also want to welcome, in addition to everyone who's joining us, our new advisor, Brian Farrell, who is the faculty dean of Leverett. Yes, please give him a virtual round of applause. Show him some love in the chat. He is um, a professor of OEB. Is that the right bio? Amazing. <laughs> Sean's got us with some DJing, and we are so thrilled to welcome him. Expect he'll be giving his own Hawk Talk in the fall and has really been great to work with already and so excited for him to be able to take the baton. It's hard to replace Sean, but we're so excited to have you, Brian. Thank um, you. I'm delighted. Great. And joining us, we also have Sean, who has been the Hawk faculty advisor for many years, has been the faculty dean of Adams House for many years. Um, also a jack of all trades and has been an amazing advocate for child's health and also a real explorer of the wilderness. He, if you haven't checked out his various websites, there is some incredible photography on there, some of which we'll be seeing tonight. Um, and really just a wonderful and reflective person who we are so excited to hear from on this Earth Day. So really thank you for joining us, Sean. I'm going to shout back to Megan because I think you've done a remarkable job this year with your talks with a year, you know, of being indoors or, you know, not being outdoors together, which is part of the joy of being outdoors. Um, and uh, the Outing Club um, has been a really important part of Adam's House life, as all of you know, uh, for decades and decades and decades, because it's been in Claverly. And it was sad to us that, um, uh, can you let them in? No, I still have to do this. I've got people in the waiting room. Um, okay. Um, so having both the Outing Club and the Mountaineering Club in Claverly was really important. It was important to the, um, to the community. It was important to Adam's house. And it was a sadness when probably the only sadness, and that's, I hadn't thought about this before, um, for house renovation was that uh, the outing club and the mountaineering club had to move out of there. Um, we have put little plaques on the wall where, where you were um, to uh, signify our thanks and, and our fond memories of you. So um, I think now with no further ado, um, I am going to share my screen and talk. What I would like is for all of you to um, unmute because I will probably be asking you um, to comment. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm calling this a natural history because as I was growing up, um, biological science was really natural history. I'll go, I'll comment a little bit more on this in the past. Um, I grew up in a lot of different places, but much of the time um, it was in cities and I hated cities as Judy um, can tell you. Uh, I always was dreaming about being outside um, and in wilderness particularly. The farther north, the farther west I could go, the better I liked it. But then, you know, there's some good places in the south especially the further south you go. Um, and so it was important to me to think about this. And when I went out, I thrived um, in the wilderness. Uh, and so these are a few recommendations that I have for you, which I will elaborate on a little bit um, as we go. So become a disciplined observer while hiking. We all love to hike. Hiking is wonderful. Um, it's wonderful for a lot of reasons, but what I'm asking you to do is think while you're on there, not only use it as a, a way of relaxing and enjoying the outdoors, but look at things and listen to things. I will illustrate those in a couple of ways as we go through. Um, think about where you're going, what's out there, what the animals are, what the rocks look like, what the vegetation looks like, and think um, about what other places you've been in where the same animals and plants have been and how they're thriving and how they're functioning differently. And when you go, 
uh, I have found it very valuable, as Megan commented on, um, to record things. A little bit as a scientist, I am a basic scientist, and that's a very important part of my being, as well as being an outdoorsman and a hiker and a whatever else. Um, and so the history is you read about other people who have valued and commented and made discoveries about the outdoors is how much they documented things and how much they collected. And in the old days, those collections were often at the expense of the lives of the animals and plants. So people killed things, you know, and then they brought them home. They pulled them up out of the earth and they brought them home. And then they studied them and then they put in them in museums. And that's how people learn. Now we obviously have a different way of learning about science um, and natural history. Uh, so to the degree you can take a camera or take a pad or take something that allows you to record observations and comparisons that you, that you might find. Um, and then finally, and we'll come back to this, uh, particularly on this Earth Day, work with organizations. It, it may be um, $5 a year or five minutes a month, but work with others because that's where your power is going to be, is in uh, concert with the other people are, um, around uh, doing things full time. So I want to give you just a brief history of me and my family. So on April 8th, 1869, one of my great, great grandfathers, when his son was 11 years old, held a formal meeting in the front parlor of his home in New York City to draft the charter that established the American Museum of Natural History. That person was named Theodore Roosevelt Sr. And he was the father of Theodore Roosevelt, the future president's father. Theodore Roosevelt, the boy, loved birds and animals and being outdoors, although he lived a good deal of his life in the city too. And he was a very kind of weakling kid who had to build himself up. But one of the reasons he wanted to build himself up was so that he could hike and uh, enjoy the outdoors. I mentioned a little bit about what biology was at that time. Biology was natural history. And when you, when you think of people like Theodore Roosevelt and you think about John Muir and you think about Charles Darwin, um, what did they do? They traveled all over the place. They read and wrote and picked things up and looked at them carefully. And so um, we'll, we'll come back a little bit, but when I was here at Harvard um, in the 60s, I uh, concentrated in biology and there was one biology concentration at Harvard. Now there are six or eight or 10 or however many there are because we are studying it so differently. But as I was growing up, the way to study it was to be outdoors, was to hunt because in hunting you learn the um, behavior uh, and the food and everything else of the animals you were looking at, examining and writing about them. Um, and so Theodore Roosevelt uh, hiked and explored and watched and shot animals. And for that reason, a lot of people are saying, you know, what, he, what, what kind of a conservationist was this man? What kind of a biologist he was? He was a man of his times. And that's what we had. Those are the um, tools that we had. Uh, as a young adult, T.R. went to the Dakota Territories after his mother and his wife died on the same day. And he went out there because he really wanted to be out in the wilderness. And he bought a cattle ranch and he lived in um, South Dakota and North Dakota and Montana for, for two years. And one of the things he noticed was that the bison herds that he had read about and the beavers that he had read about and seen in New England to some degree were gone. And so he realized that this was because humans were driving them out of there, killing them with guns, but also crowding them out of the spaces um, that they had lived. Um, he then, um, as uh, a, a young president, um, met with John Muir, who was then well known as an advocate for wilderness um, in Yosemite. And he actually sent all of his press corps and secret servicemen and everybody away 
and he and John Muir camped for a weekend in Yosemite. And you know, with it, that was a turning point of, uh, of his life and his ideas of conservation and preservation. This is a funny picture to me. This, uh, um, this is Theodore Roosevelt in, in the Badlands. But it looks to me as if this is a grown-up Theodore Roosevelt. This is a Roosevelt after he was president, not when he was actually first in the Badlands. And the Badlands had changed a great deal um, in that time. Here he is with um, John Muir. And I don't know if you can see my pointer, but this is TR on the right and John Muir on the left. And they were coming back out of the wilderness um, from uh, their camping trip. Uh, and over the years, as we, uh, you know, we, we know, he went to Africa, he went to South America, he went all over the place looking at animals and hunting. Um, and again, people criticize him for it, but not completely fairly, because what he did in all of his explorations, he was funded by museums and other organizations to bring back specimens to put in museums. And so the Museum of Natural History in New York and the Chicago Field, Field Museum were two of them that took the skins that he had and mounted them and made the first real dioramas painted background so that it looked like um, Asia, in this case with Asian uh, buffalo and uh, other places. And there, look at here, we've got a, another egret. So Brian, we may comment <laughs> so before. Here is a, uh, a cattle egret probably supposed to be in um, Asia. So this is Theodore Roosevelt's great room in Sagamore Hill. And it's unrepresentative of how he lived, um, but he built this as president as the, a meeting room where he did a great deal of his um, uh, work with international leaders. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating um, peace in Asia in this room and others. But you can see just everything is cluttered with samples. Um, and here is a picture of Darwin's study, which similarly is filled with specimens. What did they do? They brought specimens back. They studied them. They looked at them. They compared them. They wrote left and right all the time. Theodore Roosevelt wrote something like 47 books. I don't know how many Darwin wrote, but he wrote some pretty important ones. So um, I wanted to show you here is a map that we were given um, uh, by um, one of my cousins. Um, and I might not uh, have, have mentioned the connection. I am uh, the great grandchild of Theodore Roosevelt and the fourth cousin of Franklin Roosevelt. And this particular map uh, shows both, um, let me just see if I'm missing somebody. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, that's interesting. I will one of our former tutors is joining us. So um, both uh, Theodore Roosevelt and um, Franklin Roosevelt had a f did a fair amount of conservation. And as you can see by these lists, these are the lists of the public spaces which were preserved by Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt. Um, so I wanted to make a distinction between conservation and preservation. Um, what Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir were trying to do in Yosemite was preserve um, and the Grand Canyon as well. Um, what we're doing now is uh, conservation. Um, and so, let's see, could I have that backwards? Um, no, we're, what they wanted to do was to leave pristine space pristine. Um, and what we're doing now is trying to restore space. And many of the spaces we're trying to restore are ones which um, had hugely rich ecosystems for um, animals and plants. Uh, and this map is quite a wonderful one detailing all of those. So um, my grandfather, Kermit Roosevelt, was Theodore Roosevelt's son and exploring and hunting companion. Um, 
And as I said, I sort of grew up dreaming of being in the mountains and occasionally was able to be there. Um, I was a natural historian um, and thought I had invented the Nature Conservancy when I was about six or seven years old. Unfortunately, it had been invented about a year or two before um, I decided that I was going to invent it. But it's an extraordinary um, uh, land conservation organization. Um, as a freshman at Harvard, I said I took a freshman seminar, which was new in those days. That was 1963. I went out to the um, Lincoln, um, Massachusetts, to the Audubon Society and worked for a year and a half. Actually, with the, it appears, I just one car was in. I'm not sure. Um, worked with a uh, director of research at the um, Audubon Society there and became for a while the world expert in the subnival activities of Tamiascurius hadsonicus, which means that the under snow activity of the red squirrel. Um, so for, for a while I was a world expert in something. Um, I then went to Rockefeller University in neurophysiology and animal communication transferred um, into medicine as a medical scientist, transferred from there intellectually um, into a uh, clinician and pediatrician, which um, I've spent my less of rest of my life working with inner city poor children in New York and Worcester and Boston, but dreaming of the wilderness. Um, and I am proud to say, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, that um, our daughter, after having lived with me looking at magazines like Smithsonian and uh, various other magazines and being confused as to what the hell is he looking at, um, about 20 years later, realized how important it was and how wonderful it is. And she has become the CEO of an organization called C2S2, um, of which I will say more in a minute. So this is the... Um, one of the posters that uh, um, I lived with in college. Um, and it's still on my walls or next to my walls. Um, this is Kilimanjaro uh, and this is the Serengeti. Um, I dreamed of two different places being two different places. This is one. Who knows? Unmute yourselves, guys. I told you I was going to ask you to, to tell me. What is this? Where is this? And why would it be one of my dreams? I don't hear anybody. And Gorongoro Crater? Oh, thank you, Brian. Now, come on. That's true. Yes, he's exactly <laughs> right. So, <laughs> and Gorongoro Crater is, is a dream. And I can come back at the end of this and we can talk lots more about um, uh, unique places like this. It's in Tanzania, um, and it is now preserved for animals alone. Um, the uh, Maasai who lived in here um, are no longer allowed to live here um, so that it can be pristine. And this is what the place looks like. It is just utterly and completely filled with, with animal life of all sorts, predators and prey um, alike, and is one of the sites where the wildebeest migration, um, circular migration every year goes on. This is what it looks like during that migration. Um, and again, there's lots more we can say about it, but what it shows is the balance of nature at its most raw. Yes, there are lions um, and cheetahs and leopards in here. Maybe no leopards. I didn't see any leopards, but um, so these are animals that do live and die together here. Um, but uh, you can just see them as far as the eye um, uh, can see. The other place that I wanted to be, um, I dreamed of being as a, as a youngster uh, was here. And this is the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and the Great Barrier Reef, like in Gorongoro, um, is one of the most extraordinary rich um, sites of both flora and fauna left as um, relatively pristinely. Now, humans have uh, screwed it up by um, adding plastic to the waters and 
doing all sorts of things to change the um, environment around the Great Barrier Reef, but it is extraordinary. And I just want you for a moment to imagine yourself at the top of this reef. And the top of this reef um, sits usually about two or three feet underneath the um, level of the water, the sea level of the water. And so as you swim, you dive, um, you can swim out over this flat, very superficial surface of the, uh, the, the reef and you come to this edge and you look down over this precipice that goes thousands of feet down and you see layer after layer after layer of fish and, and coral um, living together and moving together, which is what Ngorongoro looks like as well. So just notes on this. We promised that there would be something about hiking, but really what I'm urging people to do is um, think of hiking less as just pure exercise and physical relief and social relief, but also as exploring, which is looking for things, looking for new things to you and possibly to others. And I'm urging you to explore every time you go, take a camera, a sketch pad and a computer, as I said, know the territory before you're going. Now we're lucky enough that we've got vast resources to know what the flora and fauna is of where you're going. And we all love the maps that you can get, the National Geodetic Maps. Um, so you can study the terrain, you can study the, um, uh, the plants and the animals. Think about the ecosystems, and I'll come back to this in a minute, uh, that you're moving through now, particularly as you go up a mountain, because the ecosystems change, right? At the rivers at the bottom of it, um, it is quite verdant. And as you climb higher and higher, the, book, the trees become smaller, the rocks become more evident until you get above the tree line, et cetera, et cetera. So be thinking about how that moves and how those parallel, not only among the um, latitudes of the world, but also about the altitudes. So you change ecosystems um, as you go up, just the way you change ecosystems as you go north and south. So think about those things. Prepare yourself for the eventualities, hike alertly and listen as you go. And um, I would like to, let's see if this works. I hope it does. Um, play you this. Uh, Zuber Buller, and he's a professor of psychology at the University of St. Andrews, which is in Scotland. Where does the story actually take place? Because where's the jungle? Yeah. Well, I, 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 maybe the best place to start is to kind of describe the the scene where we are, okay. which is in the Thai forest, Thai forest, which is in the Ivory Coast in Africa. So it's not in Thailand. No, it's not. It's T A I. T A I. Okay. Yeah. And. Klaus describes the jungle as this thick sensory world. Very dark, very moist, and very, very green. And you can't really see for more than 15 to 20 feet. And I mean, sometimes you feel like you, you walk through, uh, you know, a, a big cathedral of dark trees and you don't see very much because all the animals are uh, obviously very shy and run away. I mean, is it still? <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it is it is very, very noisy. It's a dip. It's just this kind of sonic chaos. All these insects and birds and bats and mammals, it is almost as if they compete for acoustic space. So it is very, very loud. I mean, the, the main sensation you have in the beginning really is that you're, you're just Lost. So it's 1991, sure. and he figured he had to start somewhere. So he focuses attention on a kind of monkey. A very beautiful monkey. Uh, called the Diana monkey. This mix black, white, and sort of reddish. Diana monkeys live up in the treetops, which can be as high as 100 feet off the ground. Wow. They eat fruits, and they eat insects, and they're chattering. A cacophony of calls. Which to him, of course, you know, as a, as a newcomer to the forest, was all just noise. It's just a little bit, I imagine, like a, a child trying to learn a language, which initially must just sound like a, 
string of sounds that you can't really understand and then you know what so what did he do well he started provoking the monkeys into making different kinds of noises for instance he'd walk out into the forest with a boombox speaker and play the sound of the diana monkey's most feared predator the leopard he would just play the sound into the trees yep well, and all of a sudden suddenly they start leaping around the branches hopping around motion and they make this one particular call you know this very loud alarm calls this one here any more yeah are they just saying like run or is it something more specific well here's where it gets a little bit more interesting next step he brought that same cassette player out, pointed at the trees to play all that. Yep, but this time he plays the shrieks of the crowned eagle. Eagles eat monkeys? Yeah, they do. They attack from above. I've heard about them. They're very scary. They come flying in with their talons or their beaks and they hit you in the head sharply and kill you instantly. Oof. And then you fall to the ground. Yeah. And so what do the monkeys do when they hear this? They make <laughs> that sound. Same one. Well, that's what he thought, but when he went back to the lab and started looking at the sounds on the computer, comparing one to the other, eagle, leopard, eagle, leopard, he realized that they're actually slightly different. In huh. the acoustic details of the call, and it's something that is very difficult to hear when you're you really only see it in, in the spectrogram, which is kind of a visual representation of these calls. It's on the computer? Yeah. But interestingly, once you've seen that, and once you know what to pay attention to, you go out into the forest and suddenly you do hear these differences, which you haven't heard before. So you're saying when they hear a call leopard coming, they go up the tree, but when they hear eagle coming, they run down the tree? Exactly, exactly. So it's really kind of like a word. They it's yeah. like a word. Now, here's an interesting question. I mean, if a French couple was sitting next to me on the subway and they were saying, do you know where Sam was last night? In French. If I don't speak French, I'm outside of that conversation. But a lot of people do speak French and they can listen to French people talking. My question is then, Ray, if you live in the forest and you speak chimp or you speak eagle or you speak snake, would you ever be able to overhear or learn something from a neighborly species? In other words, is there an equivalent of listening to the other person talking French in, in the wild? Hmm. Good question. And that brings us back to Klaus. Well, Klaus was wondering the same thing. So take those alarm calls, for instance. He wanted to know whether different species of monkeys could understand each other. All right, so... Um, and luckily for Klaus, there's like at least 10 different primate species living inside that Thai forest. So there's... Um, One, colobus monkeys. Two, spot-nosed monkeys. Three, chimpanzees. Four, galagos. Five, colobines. Six, honey-nosed monkeys. Seven, mangabe species. Eight, prosimians. Nine, campos monkeys. And then the dianas, ten. Yeah, so it's a very, very rich primate fauna. So Klaus's question was, could Diana monkeys understand the alarm calls of another one of these monkeys, the Campbell's monkey? Or could they go across monkey lines, so to speak? Exactly. Mm. So he used that same setup from before. The speaker thing where he plays the sound into the trees? Yeah, and he played the eagle and leopard alarm calls from the Campbell's monkeys to the Dianas to see if they'd react. And what we found there to our great surprise was that the Diana monkeys they understand it. Really? Really? Yeah. They take the very, very seriously and respond to it very strongly. So a Diana monkey hearing a Campbell's eagle alarm call will respond as though there were an eagle and will respond to the leopard alarm call as though there were a leopard and vice versa. And it doesn't stop there. Klaus started playing the monkey calls to birds. Such as hornbills. Yellow casked hornbills. It turns out that... They understand it. The birds? Yeah. These hornbills are capable of discriminating these different monkey alarm calls. Wow. So it's a pretty substantial web species. Now, so why am I doing that? A number of biologists are uh, musicians. And um, one of the things that... Uh, Sound. What have you got? Can you hear me? No sound. All right, let's see.
But you're fine, sweetie. All right, okay. So um, I wanted to play that because I want you to be listening into the world as well. And one of the things I did as a graduate student was I studied whale communication. Um, and we can come back to this because I have a recording of whale sounds um, here, which are quite wonderful. And I was studying at Rockefeller um, humpback whale communication, which can happen not just over um, feet in the jungle, but hundreds of miles in the ocean. Um, and one of the things that the person in the radio lab story that we were just hearing uh, discovered was that um, he could interpret the monkey calls. Um, and one episode that he had, he could understand that he was actually being tracked by the leopard, by the calls of the monkeys in the trees. So he would hear the, the call ahead of him and behind him. And as he moved, he heard the call saying, watch out for the leopard, watch out for the leopard, watch out for the leopard as he moved. He actually was never attacked, but it was clear to him that um, if he knew more and you and I knew more about what animals were saying out there, uh, just like those fairy tales um, from 100 and 200 years ago, uh, children's stories, you could understand to some degree what um, animals were saying. So I'm urging you to think about sound as well as, um, let's see. Now, why am I not able to move on? Okay. Um, now, what do we do? So I studied red squirrels. I was a hiker. I watched, I took photographs. Um, and I'm happy to show you some later if you want to. Um, and so then the question was, what could you do um, in order to continue this um, preservation and conservation and restore it? So here we come to Katie Palfrey, who I hope is on um, this call at least um, from the Conservation Center's Centers for Species Survival. C2S2 is a Smithsonian institution, um, US and Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service affiliated non-governmental organization that works with many of the country's zoos and wildlife parks to restore healthy genetically diverse populations of extremely endangered species on private and public lands. Hey, Papa, I'm here on the call. Hello, Katie. <laughs> Hello, Papa. Um, so I'm hoping this comes up because I love their website and I love this. Look at this panorama. Do it again. Can you hear it? Can you see it? No. No. So it, there's no sound to this, but you can you can see the pictures, right? No. Oh, boy. I'm now screen sharing. Yeah, I think you'll have to unscreen share and then screen share your desktop. I think you might just be sharing your presentation right now. All right. My desktop, okay. Now we, okay. Anyway. This, what I wanted you basically to see was, oh, you know what's happening. My medical school um, uh, email is, is conflicting with what I was trying to show you. But um, so I want you to um, hear about the um, C2S2, which is Conservation Centers for Species Survival. Um, and now I want to get myself back to screen sharing. You can see what I've got there. Sorry for technical dis. So um, there, the website is wonderful. And um, I will give Katie a little bit of screen time in, in a moment um, to describe to you uh, what she's doing, but I want to frame it um, in the sort of the ecologist's um, sense of the world. 
I was talking about how ecosystems change as we go up. Um, and uh, in altitude, which parallels the way ecosystems change um, as we go north and south. Um, so here's a map that shows you the um, latitude and longitudinal ecosystems in the world. And so if you have a, an endangered species here in Africa, um, the parallel ecosystems are most likely to exist in the other green areas of this color green, north and south of the equator. Same thing's true with savanna, same thing's true with desert. Um, so uh, for instance, where Tanzania was on Gorongoro is, is in here um, and it's savanna and there's savanna in Brazil. Um, and there's areas of savanna um, scattered throughout Australia and other continents. So keeping, if you've got an endangered species that is endangered because of threat of hunters, threat of poachers, threat of water loss, threat of um, people uh, hunting them, then perhaps there's a parallel ecosystem somewhere else in the world where you could um, naturally uh, introduce these animals in a controlled way um, and, uh, and have them uh, reproduce safely. And because you have close attention to them, you have um, the opportunity to do this genetically. And one of the um, relatively unique uh, aspects of C2S2, Smithsonian and Fish and Wildlife is that they have the genetics of all these animals. Um, and so what they can do um, is they can make sure that the populations that are being built are built as purely as possible. One of the interesting things about bison, this bison looks like a bison. Another picture is a bison that I have look like regular bison. But over the century or two, um, since cattle was introduced into the bison territories, bison have interbred with cattle. And so even though they look like uh, bison, they are actually mixed. The same thing is true with red wolves and coyotes. Same thing is true over and over again with multiple different species. But so under controlled circumstances in parallel ecosystems, you can make sure that the genetics of the animals you're breeding and then spreading elsewhere um, can be uh, maintained. This graph shows the inner the interference that humans have on a number of different um, ecosystems, all the way from uh, the mangroves forests and the uh, coral reefs and the seagrass ecosystems up the rivers along the changes that we make to the rivers with pollution or flood control um, through uh, farming and dams and uh, industry. Um, at every level and how this affects not just the fauna, but the flora of it. And I just wanted to remind you that there are not just macrobiomes, which we've been talking about, but microbiomes. And so there are more microorganisms in our body, or at least as many um, as there are cells in our body. Um, and we are a microbiome. Um, and Remember, therefore, that animals being put in one place or another, or even genetically different plants, um, change the microbiome of the region that you're in. So we are, we are hoping to be good stewards on Earth Day and whatever. What do we mean by good stewards? We want to reverse harmful activities and reestablish balance, not necessarily exactly the way it was before, not kicking everybody else out, but in some places we are and protecting it, but others um, were just trying to create a, uh, a balance again. The Native Americans who were here before um, the Europeans uh, came had a very, very sophisticated way of managing their environment. Um, and I just got a book about the environmental 
um, management that the Native Americans had for 800 years or so of the California coastline. Um, and this involves pruning and cutting and burning and planting so that they could maintain the richest way that for growth. So if you prune or you burn, then you can bring a, a healthy plant back into a healthier system locally. And so that they were very effective at this. Um, and they were able to renew and weaken capacities of soil and landscapes and populate plant populations. Um, and obviously um, th there are dangers to doing um, uh, species reconstruction by introducing say uh, gazelles into plainlands where there are cattle and other species. So you don't want to introduce invasive species. You don't want to change local ecosystems, but you want to find um, systems that and, and spaces that are available. And one of the ways to do this is to work with the, not just the national parks that have space or the Bureau of Land Management that has space, but the private owners um, who um, own so much. Now, here, Katie has turned off her, um, her picture, but th this is our daughter, Katie. Um, there she is, and I'm gonna have her talk just for a minute. Who are these the friends of yours? And do you wanna tell us a little bit about um, uh, you, um, C2S2? You can unmute yourself. Yes. There you, there you go. Hello, hi. hi. Yes, yeah, so actually, if you, if you look in the background, uh, spring is blooming here in Texas. Um, so I am out here where there are vast landscapes that are owned, uh, largely privately owned. So uh, in Texas, about 98% of the land is privately owned. And these are uh, tremendous resources for conservation, both in terms of the native species that live on those lands, as well as opportunities, as, as my dad's talking about, for using the parallel ecosystems to create large populations of endangered species outside of their habitats. So um, we'll come back to some of that. Uh, so the factors when you're rebuilding species populations, you wanna have um, the, the most healthy environments that you can have both flora and fauna. Um, we want to act against uh, the effects of climate change, even though we know that it's going to happen, what are the effects such as migration routes um, and latitude alterations of, um, uh, of climate change? Um, and this is part of the EPA, and I'm not gonna, this is not a recording, but um, I hope that, can you see this or not? Even though I'm screen sharing, you can't. This is, but it, and you can, we can share the slideshow. This is the EPA's Climate Impacts on Ecosystems website, which is very beautiful. Um, and what it, what it shows you is if you, what happens if you disrupt one element of an ecosystem, um, what else is affected? And how do we need to consider that as we're thinking about reviving, restoring, maintaining, conserving ecosystems and the animals that are in there. And one thing that I came across, for instance, there's a little little animal who's a, a rodent called a pika. Um, I think he's, in a, he's a rodent. Uh, maybe Brian can tell me. Oh, he's not a rodent, he says. What is he? He's a little rabbit. He's a rabbit. Well, I thought rabbits were rodents. Nope, completely independent. All right, so he's yeah, not. Yeah. No. He, he's a rabbit-like critter who is very sensitive to altitude and temperature. And so, if you consider climate change, and this pikas live in um, elevations of mountains, as the um, climate changes, the pika cannot go down and wander off to the next ecosystem, trying to find one that is um, compatible for him, because he can't survive down in the warmer climbs at the lower altitudes of, um, uh, of the mountains. Same thing is true with water. Um, there are ecosystems that, that animals who live around water cannot transfer their migration routes 
cannot transfer their habitats very well. So um, other elements that we think about as we're introducing endangered species is, um, will the animals improve the ecosystem? Will they make private lands more valuable and therefore stimulate the owners to want to do uh, conservation activities? Um, and that you need all sorts of scientists and environmental management. Um, and so uh, I think what I'm going to do here, um, there's a good deal more to say, but Katie and Katie can answer for you. How do we work with the private um, the landowners who are hunters? Um, how do we deal with poachers, um, not just in the United States, but around the world? Farmers, ranchers, and industrial opponents and allies. And are there tax regulations that can help us stimulate um, uh, effects on animal conservation? Who are the partners? There are all sorts of partners. Um, and uh, all, all the way from native uh, populations who want to restore buffalo bison um, populations to landowners and developers that she and we have to work with. This is an interesting map that just gives you, it is not geographically accurate, but it is proportional. So that you've got, here's the amount, the proportion of the United States that's private family owned timberland. This is paddock, pasture um, range land. You've got feed land here. The 100 largest landowners own more than the, uh, uh, extent of um, acreage of, of Florida in the country. Um, so who are we? And I just, I do want to ask you now, I'm going to stop a little bit early because I, I want to hear what all of you are doing. Where have you gone? What has affected you most? Um, what are the issues that affect you most? And many of us do little bits and pieces, unlike Katie, who spends her life doing this, but what have you found valuable and important to you and valuable and important to the, uh, the species around you? So just in brief at the end, um, here are some of the ecosystems um, that I have enjoyed. This is in Montana. This was in Tanzania. This one is in Argentina and Patagonia. This one is in Colorado. This one again is in Argentina. This is a, uh, an iceberg in Lago, Argentina in a lake. Um, here's the big bull in uh, TR National um, Park in South Dakota. Um, these are actually in Texas. These are at Katie's um, uh, fossil rim uh, preserve. Uh, these are um, uh, roe deer? No. Fallow deer. Fallow, fallow deer, right. Um, these, are, th these are in Atacama Desert Flamingos. Um, these are cheetahs in the Serengeti. Um, this is a uh, golden crowned crane also in the Serengeti. Um, lions there as well. Hippos nearby and elephants. So um, this is sort of um, what I hope uh, we can all do. Um, and so I would like to open this up and have um, the audience tell us what the most meaningful experiences you have had in your wanderings. Um, and do any of you work with any um, organizations that uh, um, uh, you found valuable? And uh, gratifying. No, nobody's wandered anywhere that they like. What's their favorite habitat? What's your favorite place and why? Okay, I'll start. It's not my favorite place, but um, it is a place I love a lot. I grew up um, for a few years on the Gulf of Mexico. And so some of my early introduction to conservation efforts started with like, beach cleanups to try to um, clean up the ecosystem for 
wildlife. And then um, obviously very tragically, the BP oil spill was a, like, made a huge impact on the community I lived in. And so that was a, a real turning point, I would say, for me to see how it affected like the place where I played as a kid and also how it affected the animals. Wow. That's the uh, a favorite. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, a, a favorite place of mine is um, like Chesapeake Bay. I've kind of like grown up in Maryland the majority of my life. And um, like learning about the Chesapeake Bay and working with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation to learn how like the bay is being, um, well, in a lot of ways, the bay is being negatively affected by climate change and like policies of the surrounding states and like the states in the watershed. But there are also a few ways that the bay is improving um like through the the hard work and stewardship of uh environmental organizations like chesapeake bay foundation and uh yeah i just really like the chesapeake bay i, I like like the water and the wildlife uh yeah thank you that that's a, a great uh, story of, of success because the blue crab was almost gone uh and the whole state really got behind the uh, chesapeake bay foundation and you can get blue crab now, right? I love blue crab. <laughs> uh, and yes, we can also look at them and not eat them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could go next. Um, I'm actually from North Dakota. So I love Theodore Roosevelt National Park. <laughs> um, uh, but last summer I worked um, helping grad students in conservation and ecology collect field data in North Dakota. And yeah. I love the birds, love the badlands, and the cattle egrets. <laughs> the cattle egrets, right? There you go. Who else? Um, I grew up on, or I grew up going to the coast of Maine a lot during my summers, um, specifically the Penobscot, and doing a lot of kayaking in between all the islands and tide pooling. Um, and yeah, would collect a big bucket at low tide, which I would call the pale of life, where I put like crabs and um, sea urchins and starfish. And it was even interesting in like the, over the 10 years that I went there, like the number of starfish decreased a lot and like the number of sea urchins went up. Um, just kind of like seeing um, ecology and like ecological change at work. Um, and yeah, so many cool things in that area. <clears throat> I, I spent a summer doing um, population studies of, of gulls and terns and other birds in that area and um, uh, around Vinyl Haven and um, it's very beautiful and fun. Yeah, I, the bird watching out there is also so amazing as well. Um, Vinyl Haven, yeah, it's a really cool area. Who else? Samantha. I can go, yeah. Um, so I grew up going to Lake Winnipesaukee with my grandparents every summer. And there's this island, um, I don't know what it's like officially called, but everyone there calls it Blueberry Island because there's a lot of wild blueberries. And there's um, a lot of years we would see bald eagles living there, which is really cool because even though they're like a symbol of America, you don't see them that often. But um, it's really cool because Lake Winnipesaukee is kept really clean, um, like from spills and stuff because they don't really let the people who live there even like fertilize their lawn with certain stuff because they're so um, intentional about preserving the wildlife in the lake. I, I am happy to continue. We're now at the hour, but I wanted to give Katie um, sort of last word if she wanted to. Um, and then I'm happy to stay around for the next 20 minutes or half an hour to talk some more, show you more pictures, discuss um, interventions. Uh, thanks for the amazing um, presentation, Dad. That was really inspiring. And uh, I really appreciate um, everything that you're doing for C2S2. Um, and we would love to hear from folks who you know, might want to participate in some way. Um, we'd love to have uh, some, some interns over the summer. So please let uh, my dad know that uh, you're interested and we can pursue that. <laughs> See some smiles. Maybe that would be a cool thing. Nathan, did you want to say something? 
I always love to say things. Um, I don't know. I was I was just going to say one of my favorite places I've been and done a lot of uh, ecological research is the Harvard Forest. Um, I've done a lot of research specifically on um, hemlock trees, which are very threatened throughout their range in the eastern um, Americas and um, specifically by the hemlock woolly adeldrid, which Willy is in, Adelgid. in the Yeah. And so um, I really like the hemlocks, especially where they live just on these like rugged, gorgeous hillsides, and um, especially on, on Mount Wachusett. So it was really fun spending some time out there doing work with the REU. And unfortunately, the prognosis is very bad for hemlock trees, but, um, you know, enjoy them while you can. And hopefully, we'll be able to find some means of biological control for this invasive species. Did, did, did but thank you for the talk, Sean. I really enjoyed it. No, thanks. Did, did, did we, we lost a, um, a hemlock in a Randolph courtyard at Apthorpe in um, Adam's house from the Woolly Adelgid as well. It was a three or four year struggle. Do we know whether that was uh, a problem with uh, an infection that came in, with climate change that came in, that water or, or temperature? Do we know anything about how, why did Woolly Adelgids come in? Or, yes, so a lot of, it's really interesting question. A lot of the, um, a lot of the species that come in, come in through wood packaging and pellets through Asia, specifically with the Adelgid, it's unclear exactly how it came in, but it was several decades ago. And coincidentally, um, Eastern forests are a really great host habitat for a lot of um, Asian uh, invasive species because the, there are these species pair relationships and a lot of the forest types in Asia are Closely, closely related, but more diverse uh, in, in species than in Eastern North America. So that leads to a lot more interspecific competition. Um, so in general, these insects, um, they get really good at preying on their host plants. And so when they're able to infiltrate um, you know, any packaging then they come over here and, and do a, a good deal of damage. But um, just anecdotally, I'm not sure about hemlock, but one that's really um, on the radar and pretty a good example of how insects come over that I'm looking at right now is um, there's the lanternfly. It's quite prevalent uh, throughout south of here, specifically in Pennsylvania. I know it's pretty common, but I'm pretty sure that came over on um, like ceramic plates from the West Coast, originally from Asia, um, but they lay these egg sacs that are quite white. And so some people think that they came over on tiles or even on white, like a white car. Um, so it's, it, there are so many different ways and it's yeah. very interesting to study. Thank you. Jonas, did you want to say something? You've been on and off your uh, picture. No? Where are your favorite places? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I like a lot of places, but I probably have to go like super close to home as far as my favorite. There's a, I guess, a, a, a conservation area very, very close where I can go ride bikes or hike around. And I spent a lot of time at, at it this year with the, uh, with the pandemic. And um, I worked a job through the winter. And so I was getting done with work like late at night. And so this is the first year where I kind of went out there at night quite a few times. And there have been a ton of owls out and about this year, as well as coyotes and, and deer. So I think seeing the uh, the nighttime critters was was more of a surprise this year than anything. And uh, hopefully uh, it'll get expanded. Um, there are efforts to uh, to make it even larger. So I'm excited. That's good. Zoe? Yeah, I mean, I've been really appreciating hearing about everywhere that everyone um, feels really close to. I I mean, I think I was a little bit inspired by Sean, all of the places that you talked about that were far away um, because we've all been so locally focused this year. Yep. So yeah, I've been thinking during your talk, it kind of reminded me, I had the opportunity to go to the Amazon a few years ago and um, I got to work with um, a couple of researchers who were discovering new species of animals and of, one of them was, um, researching fungi and so mushrooms, but just the fact that we could be destroying species that we just never even knew never existed knew. Yeah. is 
so terrifying. And on the flip side, just that there are so many species that might be adapting that we in, in ways that we don't know about yet that hopefully we will and that we like have so much more to learn. <laughs> Diana or Spencer? Cold yeah. calling is a terrible thing to do, but luckily I have I have names that I can see. <laughs> Any anybody yeah. else want to anybody else want to comment about places or um, situations that you've seen? You know, invasions. This is you know we are now one world basically in the sense that um, uh, you're bringing in products from all over the world, and who knows. They used to come on ships, you know, with uh, um, with the animals in the ships, but now they're just coming in in every possible packaging. That's true. Brian, do you want to do you want to? Uh, uh, where are your favorite places? Well, yeah, like others. Thanks for asking. Uh, uh, you know, the closest to my heart is where I grew up in northern Vermont. Uh, so I love Lake Champlain, the Champlain Valley and the mountains there, uh, very close still. Um, but you know, the, the, the three habitats that most, uh, amazed me, I think as a biologist, I was a, you know, boy naturalist, I always <laughs> love natural history, uh, are, were, uh, the Sonoran Desert. Uh, I did a lot of field work there, uh, for my dissertation, uh, unbelievable plants, uh, Ocotillo, you know. Like, an, like a big green octopus stuck in the sand. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable what the plant and, uh, and everything else in the desert. Uh, but also uh, the Amazon, where I spent about five years uh, working uh, in the Manu National Park in Peru. Uh, that, uh, that gave me the perspective of where our flora and fauna in the temperate zone came from because the earth was mostly tropical through the diversification of both animals and plants. And so... The stuff that we see around us up here is fairly young in comparison, you know, like young on the order of 20, 50, 20 or 30 million years. But uh, the other place uh, that blew my socks off was uh, first time I snorkeled in the Corona Coral Reef in the Caribbean it was like flying, you know. Uh, it's true. You know, crystal clear, all the fish <laughs> beneath you. It's an unbelievable feeling. Uh, so those were all sort of life, you know, shaping really uh, events. So Katie, you have worked with a, um, a program in the Amazon too, right? Yes, called Amazon Forever. It's oh. in Iquitos. Iquitos, yeah, been there a couple times. What, what was, what is their unique population of animals or plants? So it's a white sand forest. It's so. 0.01%, I think, of the uh, Amazonian rainforest. Uh, so it has um, uh, spe many species that are specific to its location. It's very odd for some. I've never been there to this particular place, but you know, it's sort of that you have you have white sands in the middle of a jungle, um, and therefore, who lives there? What are they like? What are they good at? Um, and how can you attract the attention? Um, of the populace? Because it was from the banks of the river, somehow it cut off uh, kind of a piece of the white sand. And so that's how it got incorporated into um, some of the forest. Part, part of the job that you were doing was to try and get the people from around there to respect that land, right? Oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, such a, such a poor, uh, poor location um, and very difficult to, to travel there. Um, so they're very cut off. Yeah, I worked uh, in the Pacaya Samaria Reserve. Oh yeah, absolutely, exactly. They're they're right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's huge, like two million hectares or something. Yeah, they they work closely with them. They part of the uh, Manatee Center. Yeah, connected. I think that that was originally acquired as a debt for nature swap organized by Right World Wildlife uh, thirty years ago, something like that. Really I've seen pictures of some of the species there, and they're the craziest looking things you ever see in your life. I mean, it's just, yeah, incredible. It must have been uh, so special to have spent time there. All right, guys, this is wonderful. I, I love this conversation, and you know, I will I will miss the outing club. I must say, I'm leaving you in very capable hands um, with Brian, and I hope you'll have fun and continue to just see 
you know, the, the extraordinary opportunities both for joy and for work um, around the world in different uh, ecosystems. So, Megan, thank you for, in for inviting me and for doing such a wonderful job this year and, and before. Um, it's been a joy. Thank you, Sean, for recommending uh, me to this position and you know, uh, for what it's worth. And I, I'm honored and thank you all for being uh, such gracious hosts. Right, it's terrific. Really, thank you both. And so glad everyone tuned in. Have a great night, everyone. Yeah.